This is a short video about the bolzano weierstrass theorem. So the first thing we're going to look at before we get into that is that any sequence has a monotone subsequence. So let's talk about how would you prove such a thing. So let's let xn be any sequence of real numbers. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what's called a peak. So we're going to say a term in that sequence, xm, is a peak for that sequence if, this is trying to say, xm is taller than the rest of the points in the sequence. And I drew you a little picture here. So in my picture, if I zoom in a little bit, I'm trying to say that this point right here is taller than every single point that happens to the right of it. Therefore, I would call that point a peak. Okay, so if you think about it, for a sequence, there's two things that could happen. You could either have infinitely many peaks, or you could have only finitely many peaks. And just to give you an example, I give my picture here. Um, you know, this point right here is a peak, but this point right here is a peak also. And this point looks like maybe right here is also a peak, um, assuming that my picture continues, you know, the way that the pattern looks like it might. So there's two cases, infinitely many peaks or finitely many peaks. So, and by finitely many peaks as well, I mean, maybe it has no peaks at all. So zero peaks is definitely covered by finitely many peaks. So what we'll do is we'll finish the proof uh, between these two cases. So case one, let's say the sequence has infinitely many of these peaks. Well, why don't we denote the first peak by x of m1, so m1 some number, and I'll do the second peak by x of m2, and just so that we're clear, what do I mean by um, first, second, blah, blah, blah? I'm trying to say that uh, m, x m1 happens in the sequence before x m2 does. So I think I have a picture for you. Aha, uh -huh, here I do. So I've drawn you maybe an example of what I'm talking about. So here's the first peak, maybe here's the next peak, and what do I know? that I have infinitely many such peaks here. So I keep going, I have a ton of these things. And what I hope that you notice for the points that I highlighted is those points are decreasing. So that would be a decreasing subsequence. So these things, x sub one is the biggest one, the next one's x m two. If you keep going down that list, you've got a decreasing subsequence, which of course is an example or a type of a monotone sequence. So that takes care of case one. Case two, what if xn has finitely many peaks? And of course, by finitely many, maybe it has zero peaks. So that'll be covered here. So what we're gonna do is if there's finitely many, well then I could list them. So I'm gonna say I have m1, m2, up to mr. So I've got r these peaks. And uh, also the way that I've tried to list these as well is I told you about this one first. So it's like the term in the sequence before this one, blah, blah, blah. So they're written in order. So that's in particular, you know, if those are peaks, that means that xm1 is the tallest one and then xm2 is the next tallest, and etc. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the point right after the first peak there. So let's let s1 be that next index. So m sub r plus one. And so again, xs1 would be the first point in the sequence, or first term in the sequence, that happens after the last peak. Uh, xm, that should be an r right here, sorry about that. But I think I have a picture. So xs1 would not be a peak then, right? Since again, this should be, uh, XMR, since that is the last peak, is what I was saying to you here. And so uh, what does it mean if it's not a peak then? Well, that means that you should be able to find a point later in the sequence that's taller than this one. So there should be some, at some point later in the sequence, you should have some index S2 so that that point of the sequence, XS2, is larger than XS1. And similarly, right, XS2, well, that's past the last peak, therefore XS2 is not a peak either. So I should be able to go farther to the right of my sequence, find some index S3, so that that term in my sequence, X sub S3, is taller than X sub S2. Now I've got a picture for you. So what's happening? If MR is the last peak, right, what does that guarantee? Well, that guarantees me that nobody gets higher than this orange line where MR is, but since none of these can be peaks, right, that means that eventually, somewhere down the line, in my picture, I'm not trying to say that these are like consecutive, like, like if this isn't trying to say this is two and this is three, say, right? I'm trying to say eventually, though, you should be able to find a point that's higher than this one. And eventually, you should be able to find a point that's higher than S2. And you should be able to keep going this way. So what am I trying to say? If I continue this process, what have I got? I've got an increasing subsequence. And so I think that is my next line in my proof, which would be pretty cool because that would mean we're done because we just built a monotone sequence uh, for case two. So in either case, we can uh, create a monotone sequence. So again, any sequence of real numbers 
um, has a monotone subsequence. Pretty cool. All right, so what are we gonna use that for? We're gonna use that to prove the bolzano weierstrass theorem. That should have a hyphen there. You gotta say it with the V, right? The good German, German name there, Weierstrass. Very important theorem. So what does it say? It tells us that a bounded sequence of numbers has a convergent subsequence. Pretty cool. So how would you prove such a thing here? Let's let Xn be any bounded sequence of real numbers. So the previous result told me that Xn definitely has a monotone subsequence. But wait a minute. If Xn is bounded, then its subsequence is also bounded. So what have you got? You've got a bounded monotone sequence. Monotone convergence theorem from the last video ensures me that that sequence converges. So therefore, our bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. Pretty short. I bet you thought, because it's got a really fancy name after these super important mathematicians, that it's going to have super long proof. Nah, we already did all the work. The last thing I want to tell you about for this video is a result right after that we'll use bolzano weierstrass to prove. If you've got a bounded sequence with, and let's say x is some number such that all the subsequence of this guy converges to this number x. Well, then that would force the whole sequence itself to converge to x, is what this says. So if every subsequence of this converges to this x, then the sequence itself has to converge to x also. Okay, and so that's kind of interesting, maybe before I jump into the proof, because one of the things that we talked about is, um, you know, if the sequence, the big sequence converges, right, then all of its subsequences do. So in that sense, there's the idea that the big sequence controls what the subsequences do. And this result is trying to tell me about one instance where what can the subsequences tell me about what the big sequence does. So if all the subsequences converge to the same number, well, then so does the big sequence. Anyway, how's the proof of this go? So let's let m be the bound for the sequence. So m's some natural number. Remember, I assume that the sequence is bounded. So m's this natural number that is, you know, either taller than or lower than all the terms in the sequence is what this is trying to say. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that xn does not converge to x. So what would that mean? Remember, what's it mean to say that uh, this limit I'm sorry, that the sequence xn diverges away from x. It means you should be able to find some specific number epsilon naught, and you should be able to create a subsequence xnk where xnk is never within epsilon naught of this x. And so, uh, well, what do we know? So what xnk is a subsequence of xn, xn's bounded, so the subsequence is bounded as well. So I've kind of drawn you a picture here over to the side. Here's what my picture says. And uh, what I've tried to highlight for you, the highlighted green guys, these guys right here, here, and here, those are my subsequence X and K. So I'm saying that those things should never ever be in this blue window here, never ever. But what am, where am I at? I've got a bounded, um, bounded subsequence um, so X and K is a bounded sequence. So what we can do is apply bolzano weierstrass which will say that X and K, in other words, my highlighted guys here, they should have a conversion subsequence, right? bolzano weierstrass told me that any bounded sequence of numbers has a convergent subsequence. Therefore, so should these highlighted ones as they keep going. So I'm gonna go a little bit uh, a little bit crazy with some indices here. It's this terrible notation, but anyway, I'm just trying to emphasize that I've got a subsequence of X and K now. So I just did like inception with indices here, next level. And so, but this thing converges. But wait a minute. I mean, if this is a subsequence of X and K, it's also a subsequence of the big sequence. So what do we know? What are we assuming? Every convergent subsequence of the big sequence converges to that X. But let's think about what would that say, right? So what I'm saying is, is that of these green highlighted dots, right? There is some selection of those highlighted dots that'll converge. And by hypothesis, they have to converge to X. So that eventually, all those points have to get inside of this window, right? At some point, all of them end up inside of there. But that's a contradiction because each one of these is supposed to be one of those highlighted points that never ever fits inside of that blue window. So I think that's what I'm about to write down after I erase all these little dots. So X and K sub L, goodness gracious, is also a subsequence of XN, the big sequence. 
So it has to converge to x by hypothesis. Remember that is what we assumed about this particular sequence xn. So uh, therefore, that tells me that, well, eventually the terms in xn kl have to be within that window, within that blue window. Uh, so they have to be within epsilon naught of x. But that's a contradiction because, I mean, these are just you know, sum of these. X and KL are just sum of the X and Ks, but we assumed that these were always outside of that epsilon not window for every single uh, index, and that's your contradiction.